Good morning, everyone. We've got over 200 of you joined us now, so I think we'll get started. Uh, my name is James Parry, and I'd like you to welcome you to the latest in this series from the UK Research Integrity Office of our regular free webinars on good research practice and related topics. And today we're looking at the introduction to research integrity. So talking about basic introductory topics, key issues, and challenges relating to research integrity, to good research practice, basically. I'm delighted that I'm joined today by two great speakers to discuss the issues and share their own perspectives. I'll begin with a talk looking at the challenges involved in good research practice, that standards can seem obvious, but actually meeting them can be more challenging than you might think, and explore what researchers and organisations can do to help improve things. Uh, then Dr Irene Haynes will discuss the important issue of authorship in research, the issues that researchers face getting appropriate credit for their research contributions, the impacts that problems and issues and disputes can have on their lives, both professional and personal, and what can be done help to help problems to help avoid problems from happening. And then finally, Shamari Lewis-Wilson, who's from the Research, Culture and Communities team at the Wellcome Trust, will reflect on the work the Wellcome has been doing on research culture. Uh, they've done a survey, a reimagined research festival, and that funding organisation, like many others, is looking very hard at the environments in which researchers work and the pressures, obvious and subtle, that they face that can cause good practice to be challenging to achieve. So it'll be very interested to hear what he has to say today. Now, before we begin, I've got a couple of housekeeping announcements. Now, we are recording this webinar and this will be made available on UK Rio's website and slides from presentations will be circulated to you afterwards and also made available on our website. It only takes a couple of days to sort that out. If you have any questions that relate to uh, the talks, we've got a dedicated Q&A button, please put them in there. If you put them in the chat, we'll probably ask you to move them over so we can see all the questions in one place. And if you need advice or have questions about a particular research project, a particular publication or problem or issue of suspecting misconduct, we can't give you detailed advice in this forum. We can't give you confidential advice. So if you could please contact UK Rio via our website instead. And as I've said a couple of times now, that for those of you who just joined us, we're using Zoom's webinar function, which means that attendees' microphones, cameras and screen sharing functions are muted. So we can't see you. So sit back, kick off your shoes, have a nice cup of tea and a biscuit or a coffee. And if you've got any questions for us about the, the workings of the webinar, put them in the chat stream. Any questions for the speakers, uh, just put them in the Q&A. Right, I shall now hand over to the first speaker, uh, who is me. Uh, a couple of people said they can't hear me very well, so I will project them all. My apologies for that, and thank you very much for letting me know. And if you have crackling on your on your microphone on your speakers, that's probably uh, due to internet broadband issues, and hopefully the uh, recording will be clearer. Okay, so. I'll just bring up my slides and project a lot more. Okay. Here we go. Brilliant, okay. So I'm here today to introduce you to research integrity, which is basically a kind of fancy word for Good research practice. What do we mean by research integrity? Well, there are a few ways you can view it. It's about ensuring that your research is high quality and of high ethical standards. It's about doing the best research that you can do, and that applies to both individuals and organisations. It's about you reflecting on what challenges and pressures you face in trying to do that good research and how to overcome them. I think also very strongly it's about the research community collectively thinking about the challenges and pressures that face all researchers and all other professions working in research and about what we can do collectively to overcome them. Whether the way we fund, carry out, assess and disseminate research improves or harms quality and ethical standards, often described as issues of research culture or so-called publish or perish, and Shamari will be exploring this issue in much more detail later on. 
And when I talk about trying to do the best research that we can and trying to solve the problems that we all face and achieve with that, this isn't me being aspirational or talking in a vacuum. These are topics being considered by governments, the UK government and many others, uh, funders, publishers, advisory bodies like UK Rio. And as I said, this is happening in many other countries than just the UK. And research integrity, that umbrella term for good research practice, ties in with other so-called agendas in research, open access, open data, clinical trials transparency, reproducibility and verification of studies. These are all important parts of that broader picture of good research practice, of research integrity. This is a survey that was reported in May last year. So lockdown had been with us for a couple of months. The pandemic had been impacting very heavily on our lives and on society as a whole and globally. What struck me about this survey is while the headline and subheading are about high levels of trust in researchers, 64% of respondents are more likely to listen to qualified researchers and scientists. The highest percentage response in the survey, 97%, was about wanting to be able to see data in order to check it. And this has been echoed in various studies and surveys as well, with often the understanding from people that they may not be qualified to interpret the data that's being shown, but the fact that the data is being made openly available is considered a strong sign of reliability. Okay, I may not understand the data from that research paper that it's published. I know that the people putting it out there, you know, I, I feel they are being honest and open and that's a good thing. It increases my view of the reliability of that research. People trust, but they also want to be able to verify. It's not enough to be trustworthy in itself. To do research that is trusted and trustworthy, you have to be able to demonstrate that you and your research are worthy of that trust. And this is against a background of growing questions about the reliability of research and of researchers. There's growing interest in whether researchers are getting it right or wrong, and why. Headlines uh, can often focus on cases of research fraud, but there are broader, deeper issues in all disciplines. Yes, there's increased awareness of research misconduct and outright fraud and deliberate malpractice, but uh, there increased awareness of questionable practices, which you could define as deliberately sloppy research, and the biggest area of concerns, uh, mistakes. Honest errors, sloppiness, call it what you will, human error. It happens, and it's going to happen in every profession, but it can happen a lot in research. I think we need to look at the structural issues that can facilitate errors being harder to avoid and what we can do about those. And alongside these questions of are we getting it right or wrong, there are questions about reproducibility and verification of studies. There's a parliamentary inquiry on that topic going on right now, and questions about research culture, that publish or perish factor that I mentioned earlier. And there are increased challenges to research integrity, to good research practice in these times. The pandemic has had considerable effects on how research is designed, funded, conducted, managed, monitored and disseminated. And all of this can have, excuse me, that shut the door. all of this can impact negatively on the quality and ethical standards and integrity on research and accordingly on the public's trust in research. And this stuff has a knock-on effect on the well-being of researchers as well. Now, the UK has a justified reputation for conducting high quality and ethical research and for having a high caliber of researchers. But like every other country, we're not immune to mistakes, sloppiness and fraud. Without trust, we cannot do research. And to have that trust, we and our research must have integrity. That's why it's important. Now, the key message is, and there are probably about three key messages from this presentation, one, this is stuff you need to think about a bit more than you currently do, a bit. You're not expected to treat yourself and your colleagues as walking mistakes waiting to happen, or essential research criminals, or straightjacket yourselves in terms of your methodologies and research design and outcomes. That's not what this is about. This is about reminding yourself that integrity, ethics, good practice, basic standards, call it what you will, applies to your research. How it applies 
will probably be quite differently to the person next to you. It will depend on your discipline, your career stage, the type of research that you do, the sector and environment in which you work but it's relevant regardless whether you have external funding or not whether you have human participants or not whether you needed ethical approval or not so just keep it in mind and work out what good practice means for you for your institution for your discipline for your own research think about it a bit more than you currently do and throughout the entire life cycle of your research project from the moment you come up with the idea to the moment you disseminate it archive it and move on to something else this is something that's an inherent everyday part of professional practice. And it's worth remembering that the line between acceptable practices and unacceptable practices can sometimes be a very fine line. So all researchers need training, support and a good understanding and good judgment to avoid mistakes. And those rules, those standards aren't set by researchers themselves, they're set by others. So researchers need to keep up with the changing landscape in which they work and they need good support. They can't necessarily always work the stuff out for themselves. And it's also worth noting that research methods and avenues are constantly evolving, opening up new opportunities for benefits and new opportunities for potential harms. So the ability to think about what good research practice is and isn't and the ability to apply ethics to your research is something that's crucial. So good research practice, as I said, that's what research integrity is, meeting basic standards for your research, whether they're disciplinary standards, institutional standards, regulatory requirements, terms and conditions from funders like the Wellcome Trust who are speaking today, adopting best practice on research methods, managing your data, consent and other key issues. It's a, and this is applying to all disciplines. The specifics will vary from discipline and sub-discipline, but the overall sort of ethos and themes remain the same. And this applies to all career stages, to research at all levels of expertise and experience. And this is, as I said, something that you do actively and continuously throughout the life cycle of your research project. And this is to help you do better research. The good news is you're probably doing a lot of this already often without even realizing it. This isn't something other or alien. It's part of your everyday work, following what the rules of the road are, working out what best practice is for you and your research, and then incorporating it into what you do. This is stuff that a lot of you will be doing inherently. The, the tricky issues come when you encounter areas where you generally don't know what to do because you haven't got any background information to help you there or you get hit by unexpected bumps in the road and they will happen at this point i wouldn't blame you for thinking this is all a bit obvious don't researchers naturally practice good research and aren't the standards the rules of the road kind of self-evident if you think about it the basic fundamental standards for research can seem self-evident please don't make stuff up uh please don't steal the work of others harming research participants is bad uh embezzling research funds is generally frowned upon so the thinking goes the standards are so basic so obvious it kind of takes care of themselves and there are these that belief is enforced by a couple of assumptions one big assumption that the rules of the road are clear and the second big assumption is that mistakes questionable practices and fraud are themselves quite rare things that happen very often the profession can take pride in everything working out the way it should the problem with those assumptions is they're not at all accurate and we've got a lot of evidence to show that they're not accurate authorship is a fantastic example of why you need to think about things in more depth than you might believe so and I, my colleague Irene Haynes will be covering that in depth in her presentation. Now, the screenshots here are from genuine journals. I haven't made this stuff up and there's loads more like this. Authorship is a fantastic example of how rules exist, but they're not very clear. There is no universal rules across all disciplines on who should be and who shouldn't be an author. No universal criteria just as there are no universal rules on what is or isn't plagiarism or what is or isn't data fabrication 
Conventions can vary between disciplines and sometimes within disciplines. For example, in biomedicine, there's the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, ICMJE, and they set criteria for authorship in medicine research. But not every journal accepts those criteria. Most do, some don't, and often journals modify them a bit. So rules can vary within that discipline. Some disciplines of guidance like that, where it's written down, others authorship more or less sort of it, it's custom and tradition, and you, people can tell you how it works. And if you said, where's that written down, please? They go, I'm not sure that it is. And even in disciplines where there is written guidance, guidance requires interpretation and be hard to put into practice. OK, so someone who makes a significant practical intellectual contribution to the work becomes an author. What does significant mean? What's practical in a sense? What's intellectual? If I have the idea is that and do nothing with it, but just tell someone they're going to do something with it, does that qualify me to be an author? In some disciplines, yes. In other disciplines, it wouldn't. And then you have the order of authorship, which is, for a variety of reasons, linking to that publish or perish factor mainly, often really contentious. There are no universal rules for deciding the order of authorship, and there's no agreement on universally across all disciplines on whether the order of authorship actually matters. Some disciplines, it's ordered by your level of contribution, so you have to agree that within a team. Others, it's alphabetical. In some disciplines, being the corresponding author is fantastic. It's hooray, people will be asking me the questions about our research. In other disciplines, oh great, people will be asking me the questions about our research, and it's you don't really want to be the corresponding author. It's not seen as having any kudos attached to it. Authorship is fundamental to research. It's fundamental to research careers. We're, our research outputs are assessed on our authorship of research publications in many ways, though there's lots of work being done to move away from that model because the pressures it inputs on us are very, very real. It's called publish or perish for a reason. But it's a very good example of how the rules are not clear. And even when there are clearly defined written guidelines, putting them into practice is really, really difficult. Now, the second assumption was that mistakes and questionable practices and misconduct are rare. And there's been a lot of work on this, especially in the last 10 years or so. Uh, this is a groundbreaking systematic and meta-analysis that was carried out in 2009. It, set, it was a very detailed piece of work and it's still worth citing. And also its results have been echoed by subsequent studies or surveys. So this meta-analysis found out that just under 2% of researchers had engaged in major research fraud at least once and during a short space of time. 2%, two in every hundred, they faked stuff, they just made it up. And up to a third admitted to what are called questionable research practices, which you can define as being deliberately sloppy. And as an example, say you've got a, you've got a graph, a chart with all your data points on it, and your data points are clustered where you want them to be, but you've got some outliers and you don't like the look of them. They kind of, you think they make the, the desired results not look as good. It's 1% of your data, I'll just clean them off. And you say, I'm tidying it up, I'm making it a bit easier for people to understand. What you're not doing is presenting a full, honest and accurate picture of your data. So that's an example of questionable practice. Playing games with authorship of papers is another example. So a third of researchers, engaging in questionable research practices. They're admitting it. The EU defines the rare disease as occurring in every one in every 10,000 people or less. Study after study, survey after survey, has shown that between one and 2% of researchers have either been caught engaging in or admitted engaging in serious research fraud over a short space of time. And up to a third, admit to engaging in these questionable research practices. And then we have looking at mistakes and honest errors. And we, a good example of this is retractions of academic papers. And the common view is retractions happen because of fraud and bad things, and they do. But studies suggest that between a bit over 10%, just under 20% of retractions, happen because of mistakes and we know that systems for spotting mistakes and fraud after publication are not as good as we would like them to be so the question is then this is the stuff that we know about 
but it's going to be the tip of a much larger iceberg. The big examples of misconduct and fraud are stark and obviously bad and shocking, but actually that's the, the thin end of the wedge. It's sloppy research that's the issue. The sheer amount of avoidable mistakes that happen. So it's worth taking a step back and thinking about how could I fall into that category as a researcher? What can I do to change things? And at the same time, recognize there are things that you would find hard to change as an individual, but organizations and networks and systems are working to change those bigger factors. The last two slides have been a bit more doom and gloom. So I will uh, do something a bit more positive. UK Rio has been running an advisory service on issues of good research practice since we set up in 2006. And a recurring theme we've seen in those crikey 15 years uh, is that people can get overconfident and that can lead to major problems. They think, I know I'm right and all I've got to do is prove it. This will look so good once we've run the study, written it up. And that can be the start of a very big slippery slope. There can be problems with, group, with overconfidence in other ways, group thinking teams, people collectively dismissing challenges to their view of how things should turn out, how they think should things turn out, as well as flawed or it's noise, and it's especially hard for junior people to speak up. Also, as researchers, we, we generate or discover knowledge. We're a profession that's expected to know things. I think collectively, not everyone, not in every environment, I think there is often a problem with people thinking, my colleague's going to think I look dumb if I don't know what to do. If I stand up and say, I've got a problem, or I'm not sure what to do next, or this bad thing's happened, I don't know how to resolve it. And we worry that we'll be thought badly of if we ask for help. Whatever issues you are struggling with, I guarantee that people close to you in your profession have struggled with them too. Maybe not in the same way, but they will have done something being similar happen to them. If you've got a problem, talk to someone. Do not try and go through it alone. If you don't feel you can talk to immediate colleagues, there are systems and people in place within your institutions to help provide support. Who are people away from your immediate research teams you can go to in confidence. And there are external bodies like UK Rio who you can talk to. Whatever problem you encounter, someone will have encountered something similar before, and they will have advice and guidance with willing to help you. So don't feel bad about asking for help. But of course, as researchers, you can't go through it alone. Institutions have a duty here, a duty of care, a duty to provide support, and a duty to facilitate that reflective, self-critical research practices, which are really important. And as part of this, do think about your research, but think about what's to come. It's natural as researchers, because we're time poor and under huge amounts of pressure, to focus on what's immediately in front of you. But if you cast your mind ahead and think about what's coming down the line a bit further afield, that can be really helpful. We've often encountered problems which, if there had been a bit more anticipation, they could have been prevented. Okay, there are currently 331 of us in this webinar which is great thank you all for coming imagine we're on some big joint research project and heaven help you all i'm the pi i'm in charge and it runs for two years and because i'm a really bad pi i don't lead any discussions about the authorship of the research outputs until very close to publication with the best will in the world even if everyone gets on really well we then have 331 different perspectives on authorship we have to discuss, make everyone aware of, and then find a way to, to dovetail, to compromise on, to get to fit together in a short space of time. Authorship is something that's worth talking about early on. Now, I'm not suggesting you can fix or decide authorship early on, because research projects change and evolve over time. Roles and responsibilities change over and evolve over the time. But having those discussions is really, really important. What happens is that if you get into a mindset of talking about things early and often, they become easier to deal with because you've got more time to think about them and come to collective agreement about how best to resolve them. And if you're working on your own, it's still natural to focus on what's immediately in front of you. But again, it can save you time and a lot of grief later on if you think about stuff in advance. So good research practice is 
doing the, often it's doing the best you can under difficult circumstances. Uh, and it will manifest itself differently according to your discipline, your career stage, the particular type of research organization you work in. But there are some common themes here. Uh, the bullet points are from a groundbreaking research, research project into research culture from a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And you can't really argue with any of those principles. And you'll see similar principles in more recent studies and documents. But, and there are some themes that cut across all of these. It's about knowing what good research practice means for you and your research and sticking to it in difficult circumstances. It's about not cutting corners and encouraging others not to cut corners as well. And I think being quite reflective, what don't I know about? How do I learn more about how to do good research? There's care and respect involved for the obvious candidates, for participants and, and data, but also care and respect for colleagues and collaborators. And as part of that, I'd say also respecting disciplinary differences and being honest and open about competing interests, about being honest and open in peer review, and being honest and open about your data and results. And I think, yeah, I'm quoting from uh, Professor Leanne Hodgson at the University of Oxford, no such thing as failure is only setbacks. We will make mistakes and things will go wrong. And there will be times when we don't make mistakes, where we conduct ourselves perfectly, where the research question was a good one, the research methodology was a good one, and it's carried out perfectly, but the result isn't what we expected or what we wanted. And that can be, you know, as a profession, I think we tend to be quite personally invested in our work, and those kind of knockbacks can hit quite hard. And without diminishing how you personally feel about such setbacks, Every researcher has been there. So you're not alone. And, you know, you will, if you have those big problems in your research, for whatever reason, whether you got things wrong, whether you did everything right, but the results weren't what you wanted, it's a setback, not a failure, and you will get past it. And it's, it's part of being a researcher, I'm afraid, but you will get through it. So it's worth thinking about the kind of themes I mentioned, those principles that are on the slide, and thinking about, what would that look like for you, for your research, in your particular discipline, in your particular research team? It's also worth noting that researchers don't work in a vacuum. And Shamari will be talking about this in much more detail later, so I'll only talk about it very briefly. They're affected by the environment, systems, and behaviours and pressures that surround them. In other words, by research culture. This is a report, and I should say when we circulate the slides, do click on all the links that UK Rio and some other organisations carried out in UK Research and Innovation, the major public sector research funder, uh, and published summer of last year. And reports like this one talk about how different factors, funding, assessment, dissemination, governance, integrity and ethics and researcher career progression and development come together to put huge strains on the system. There are perverse incentives, publish or perish. There are cultural biases for publishing positive results, for publishing in certain journals. Oh, the right journals, not that one. That's a very common attitude. There are biases against withdrawing papers, biases against results which confound theory. And I think the system can often fa favour quality over quantity and creativity are often stifled. Researchers are passionate and proud about their work, but have concerns about job security and their very valid concerns. And poor research culture, and again, this will be explored later on by Shamari, is leading to things, according to survey results, such as unhealthy competition, bullying and harassment and mental health issues. It's clear something must be done, and the question is by who? Now, this is a multifaceted issue and it's a big issue. It's hard to be decisive about what we'll sort out. It's gonna take collective effort and time. The research community, I think, as a whole needs to think about what we can do. And that includes the big organizations who sort of set the tone for things, but also what we can do in our institutions, how we conduct ourselves, are there any initiatives we can be part of, things like journal clubs or networks of research integrity support and advisors, how, you know, there are lots of small scale interventions that can make a difference here. And of course, when we think of what can be viewed as the drivers of 
negative incentives in places such as grant review panels or peer review panels, for example, or promotion panels. They are aware of these pressures and they are doing what they can to change them. And we should remember that it's individual researchers who staff these panels. We peer review papers, we peer review grant applications. So there are lots of ways that we ourselves can affect change. Drawing to a close, stating the completely obvious, the pandemic has had a huge impact on society as a whole. And that includes researchers and those who, others who work in research. Our health, our well-being, and our working practices have changed. And our working practices have changed initially out of necessity, but now we're exploring how we can change them deliberately for positive effect. And the pandemic has also had considerable effects on how research is carried out in every aspect of it. And those effects will be long lasting and dependent on the level of infection control measures, the need to consider how these effects will impact on good research practice and research and well-being will remain for many months. How do we help researchers and others think about what challenges and problems in these really difficult times might affect the integrity of their research? and how to address them. And in terms of changes of working practices, how, have there been any which we should try and retain because they've been beneficial, even if they've been imposed upon us by necessity? And I should say in terms of the impact on health and well-being, harking back to what I said earlier, if you're having problems, speak out. There will be people who will listen to you and support you. Do not go through this stuff alone because it, 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 research is a high pressure profession at the best of times and we're not living in the best of times. So seriously, guys, if you've got a problem, reach out to someone. You will be heard and there are systems and structures in your organisations to support you, OK? Seriously, talk to people about this stuff. So in closing, because I've been talking on for a bit now, to take away from this session, think about what challenges do you as a researcher face when you're trying to do the best research that you can? And how do you overcome those challenges? What can you do yourselves? But also, what do others need to do? And others will be doing a lot of this stuff already. There'll be systems within your institutions and wider systems within the research community that can help you. It's one of the reasons why UK Rio was set up by a conglomeration of research funders and learned societies 15 years ago. And thinking about research culture, and Shamari is the expert in this, he's going to be speaking later. Think about what you would like to see changed, what might want to change and how we could do that. That's really important. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. We'll stop the slide share now and we'll take a few questions. We've got some in the chat already. Uh, so, but please do add more questions and we've got some time before our next speaker okay so who can a researcher speak to if they've got worries about good research practice well that's a very good question thank you and there are a variety of approaches there if you've got concerns about problems rather than concerns about misconduct and it will be concerns about problems mostly you've got a whole lot of networks you can talk to there's your peers there's your manager if you're a research student there's your supervisor there'll also be networks within your institution uh ethics committees for example are often open to having informal requests for advice put in uh many institutions have set up or are setting up networks of research integrity advisors and champions and in the central parts of the institution there will be staff who work dedicated on research integrity issues and good practice issues. So if you want to talk to people outside your immediate circle, uh, either for reasons of confidentiality or because the issue is something you don't feel comfortable about raising with immediate colleagues, then there will be people in central services departments who you can speak to as well. Your institution will have a resources page on research integrity. Uh, many of them are uh, recorded on the UK Rio website, ukrio.org, and that's a good point of contact for you to reach out to. Also, there are external places. UK Rio is an obvious one. Uh, we advise on issues relating to research practice, but there are also specialist networks. If you've got problems with publication authorship, there's the Committee on Publication Ethics, for example. The UK Reproducibility Network is doing great work on reproducibility in STEM disciplines and beyond. So there's lots of resources out there.
And I think the key point is speak out. If you've got problems, then you should not go through it alone and seek advice. Okay. Uh, what, how to, another question is how to report research misconduct. Okay, well, research misconduct in this country isn't subject to sort of statutory regulation. It's the, the duty of a research organization to ensure that uh, the work is carried out properly and according to standards and take action if it isn't. So if you've got concerns about research misconduct, the institution will have a research misconduct process and that sets out how you report allegations. Also whistleblowing protections are provided so you can do so, you can report the allegations in confidence and you'll be protected against reprisals. And also if you've got concerns about research misconduct, there are external people that you can talk to before making a report and that's something UK Rio does. Okay, so we've got a few other questions. A couple of practical questions. Yes, the recording of the talk will be circulated afterwards. Zoom kind of slap downloads it and slaps it together, and then we kind of edit it into channels on the individual talks, and we'll circulate the slides as well. Okay, uh, Jackie asks if access is a problem due to shielding, is it okay to use Zoom to face to face rather than in person interviews? Uh, the answer is a qualified yes. There may be certain types of research where in-person is desirable. And also it's worth noting that people can engage via video chats in different ways. Some people can find it less daunting than the prospect of an in-person interview. Others can find it more daunting. There are also, it's worth also thinking about consent issues, for example. People, you know, are you going to record the interview? And people can find the recording of a video call often more intrusive and nerve-wracking than and uh, a, you know, a discrete audio recording. It's also worth noting if someone's shielding, they may be, if they, even if they've given their consent prior to a research project, it's worth considering, do they want to still take part? You know, if they're having, if their lives have become very stressful due to shielding, their desire to participate in research may have changed, but equally they may not feel they can say so about it. Your institution, the good news is, Jackie, your institution will have looked at these issues already. There are, as have many learned societies, because in many ways, since lockdown started last year, so many have become internet mediated research and we haven't before. So there's lots of good guidance out there from bodies such as the Social Research Association. There are various societies dedicated to internet mediated research, and the British Psychological Society has some good guidelines on internet mediated research as well. And there's some stuff on the UK Rio website. So have a look at what guidance is available to your discipline. But if you can't find any, your organization will have some, and you should look at that as well because it will be incumbent on you to follow it. But there's also the Social Research Association, the British Psychological Society, and many others who can help. Okay. Uh, right, just looking through a couple of questions. All right. Uh, sorry, the question's loads. Don't show slow today. Okay, so Ali asks that the general public is Ali knows the general public doesn't always understand that new research can be create conflicting results and we don't know what the landscape is. And this can create a certain impression to the public, which leads to a lack of trust. Now you're absolutely right, Ali. Public trust is built over time. And I think a lot about this is how we communicate results and how we communicate the validity or reliability results, especially the early ones. And this, the public has generated has a, a much more interest in this topic these days since the onset of the pandemic. There's lots of good guidance on science communication out there. Your own organisation should have some guidance on communicating with the public and media organisations about research results. And the key is, you know, not to over promise and be very open about limitations in studies. I'd also recommend the charity Sense About Science, which is dedicated on science communication and has an awful lot of good resources that you'll find very interesting. Okay. Uh, I think we'll stop it there because we're now at 10.40 and I'd like to move to our next speaker, who's Irene Haynes, 
who's going to be looking at publication ethics and good practice in academic authorship. Now, Irene's recorded her talk, so I'm going to turn off my camera and my colleague will start the recording in a moment. Thank you very much for the questions today. I appreciate we weren't able to address some of them. And what we'll do is we'll look in UK Rear internally on how we can uh, address them and then get back to you with some answers. So thank you very much.